Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber, I'm Director of MTF Labs, and this is the MTF Podcast. So given that you're listening to a podcast right now, it's a fairly safe bet that you have a computer or a smartphone and it's connected to the internet, which means that it and you and perhaps everyone you've ever sent an email to is in some sort of 21st century peril right now. Enter the cybersecurity specialist, coding furiously against time to take down the criminal underworld, foreign agents, malware and spyware, and lock out the hackers and the bots. The hunter becomes the hunted, and so on. In fact, according to actual cybersecurity expert Yaniv Balmas, there are actually some pretty simple things you can do yourself, or stop doing, as the case may be. And there are some things you might not actually be in a position to do anything about at all. But, well, chances are, you're not as interesting a target as you might think. Here's hoping, at any rate. But given that we live in a world where everything is so very digital and so very connected, from our conversations to our thermostats, our politics to our pop music, I thought I'd have a chat with Yaniv. He's head of cyber research at Checkpoint to talk about what's going on in the world of cyber and see what I can do to avoid a catastrophic network breach or some such. Yaniv Balmas, thanks so much for joining us for the MTF podcast. Can I ask where we find you today, where, where you are right now, or would that give too much away? Well, I'm uh, at home, like uh, most of other the other people around the globe. Yeah, and where is home on the globe? Well, I live uh, just outside of Tel Aviv in Israel. And you're in cybersecurity. Is, it, is uh, Tel Aviv a good place to be doing cybersecurity? Well, Israel has been called uh, a cyber nation, you know, so... Uh, I don't know if it's uh, true or not, but yes, there's a lot of uh, cyber business going on in, in, in Tel Aviv and all around me here. All right. So we should probably just get to the very, very basics. What is cybersecurity? You know, when I started this career, there, was not, there wasn't such a term, cybersecurity, actually. It was uh, uh, security engineering, maybe, or uh, information security. Uh, so cyber is just, for me, is just a big name, a uh, big new name for something. Um, and technically what we're talking about is we're talking about um, mistakes. I mean, human mistakes usually. So we have software running, we have hardware running, uh, we have all of these mechanics and all of these electronics uh, going on. Um, they should theoretically be perfect and do exactly what they're supposed to do and nothing, absolutely nothing else. But uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends who, who you ask, uh, Depends on whether you make your living out of cybersecurity or not. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, usually it just it doesn't work that way. There are bugs, there are errors in there. Some of them are, you know, just bugs and errors. Uh, some of them might be much worse than that. And they could lead to uh, a lot of security issues. And I guess that's the core of cybersecurity. That, that, that's where it all starts. Because what I imagine when I hear cybersecurity is that there are lots of for want of a better term, baddies in the world who are trying to break things, steal things, blow things up, um, you know, make people's lives miserable. And and you're kind of like last line of defense, frantically typing like a hacker in a movie uh, onto a screen to stop them from getting it. Is it anything like that? Is anything of that true? Well, I always think, you know, about this, uh, like uh, typing like a hacker in, in a movie that if someone would ever make a film on me while I'm working, it would be like the most boring film in the world. It really doesn't look that way uh, in, in reality. Um, are we the last line of defense? I don't know. Um, I mean, there's a pretty large community. Um, some of it is by vendors, some of it by individuals, uh, some is mixed. Um, and, and there's a lot of work being done on the defensive side of cybersecurity around the world. I don't think it's enough. I don't think it will ever be enough, but uh, uh, I think that all of us, as a, as a whole, uh, we're, we're, we're doing some, we're changing something. I think we're uh, protecting the world, the cyber world, just a bit. What are we protecting it from? What, what are the actual risks? What could go wrong? Um, so many things. But the question is um, not what, but maybe who. Who are we protecting from? You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different um, individuals or groups uh, that... Um, you know, maybe a threat to someone. 
Uh, and the real question is what what is their motivation? And I think if you're looking at, at it from that perspective, you can basically divide it to two very large groups. Uh, one of them will be the ones that are financially motivated. Mm -hmm. Um, those would be mostly related to what we refer to as cybercrime uh, or scams or cybercrime or whatever. Their end goal is to steal your money like any criminal anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it really doesn't change. That's just the playground changes. So now it's the internet and the computers and not uh, pickpocketing on the streets. But the concepts are pretty much the same. Um, so that's one group of people we should be aware of. And Sometimes these these guys are pretty sophisticated uh, and do a lot of you know very advanced technical work, and sometimes they are just I don't want to say kids, but uh, un unsophisticated. I mean, they do the very bare minimum necessary in order, in order to steal your money. It looks like you know from technical perspective, it looks like uh, th this will never work, but the truth is that it works. It works uh, a lot of times. And that's the first group. Um, the second group, I think it's on one hand much, much more dangerous. Um, these are uh, usually not motivated financially, but they are motivated by um, usually their goal is to steal information. Uh, so we might be talking about business espionage. Uh, we might be talking about intelligence agencies, stuff like that. These are usually groups that are much you know, better funded than the, than the other ones. Uh, they have very high technical skills. Um, they could do a lot more damage, but they are very structured. And usually they don't attack everyone. They just attack who they need to attack. And if you're not a target for them, then you have nothing to worry about. But if you are, then it's a different story. How does surveillance uh, fit into this? Because I know there's a, a lot of talk about um, personal data security and uh, and privacy and these sorts of things. Is that in the same ballpark, the same territory? Do I need to worry about my Google Home or or you know Siri or or anything like that? Or is it uh, or is this a different domain that we're talking about? So again, it depends on how you look at. So I mean, surveillance could be if if I want to uh, uh, to do surveillance on one individual. For for example, I'm an intelligence agency. I want to do surveillance on one individual. Probably I have my tools. I have my ways of doing that. And again, you or you know most of the people in the world usually don't really have anything to worry about that because they will never be a target of of this kind of an organ of organizations simply because they are well, you know, uh, without disrespect to anyone. Uninteresting. That seems plausible. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to be uninteresting. It's a it's a it's a nice place to be. Sure. Um, but uh, on the other end, there's surveillance on a larger scale, and that's like you know when China, for example, wants to you know control all of the internet traffic that everyone does and see w wherever anyone uh, browses to. And I'm just giving China as an example. There are, other examples, not from China, of course, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's concerning. Usually, their target is not an individual; it's it's a very large group of people, um, and uh, mainly it impacts our privacy. So now, when I'm browsing to somewhere, um, I don't know. Somebody might be looking at where am I browsing. Maybe he's not specifically interested in that, but he does have this information, and this should you know worry basically anyone. Uh, because it happens, and it happens everywhere. Uh, it happens by governments. It happens by, you know, big corporations uh, that control uh, most of the internet traffic, most of the, uh, you know, search engines, uh, social networks, and so on. Uh, you, you heard it on the news. I didn't say it. And um, yes, I think privacy is something that we should all be worried about. And I think, generally speaking, we are losing our privacy. You know, day after day, we have less and less privacy. And I don't know if it's something we should, you know, accept or, you know, fight against with all our power. It's, it's, it's a new world and we should know to adapt to it in that way or the other. Mm. I'm thinking about things like uh, at, the, at the sort of the 
national, the nation state level, uh, things like uh, spies in the old kind of, in the old fashioned spy story sense of people sort of putting bugs into, well, there was a famous case of, of uh, bugs in the typewriters at the, I think it was the Pentagon, um, that were there for decades, um, collecting every single keystroke of, uh, of these uh, electric typewriters. Um, but, but now, obviously, all of our information, all of our uh, communication is all zeros and ones flying over the internet. Um, and presumably, it's not just a case of being able to listen in on that. It's now being able to manipulate that and change what that data says or to be able to um, actually control at a distance things like nuclear power plants or electricity stations or, or those sorts of things. I mean, you know, is there a nightmare scenario that all of the cybersecurity world is gearing up for? Just open Netflix and find, you know, whatever science fiction movie uh, you like, and you'll see this uh, doomsday scenario. Uh, are you saying you're already working on it? Or? No, no, it's there. <laughs> I mean, these are the movies that we grew, at least me, yeah. I, I, I uh, grew on, right? So uh, this is the doomsday scenario where, you know, um, the machines take over uh, now, uh, you know, or... Uh, I don't know, uh, something like that. But but frankly, you know, we, we live in the real world. I think espionage is not something new. It's been there, you know, since the beginning of time, I think. Uh, just a different playground. The internet is a wonderful place and it makes our life much easier, makes things closer to us, easier, more accessible. We can do things remotely. We, uh, it's, it's wonderful. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, so when somebody that doesn't have the, the, the right permissions or the right access gets into these places, then the damage potential is also much, much, much bigger uh, just because of the nature of this, you know, the internet, the, these services, it's all there. And if, he, if somebody malicious is sitting there, then he basically controls everything. And this can be applied to anything from, I don't know, from your personal emails and into nuclear power plants uh, around the world. Um, there are ways to defend against this, but if, if history told us something is that there is no 100% security. If there is a way to get in there, somebody will manage to do it. Because mm. I'm thinking we are in a, in an age where we're becoming increasing, not, it's not just us that's becoming increasingly connected, it's everything we own is becoming increasingly connected. So, you know, your home speakers, your lights, your air conditioning, your fridge, your, you know, toaster, whatever, they're all connected and speaking to each other, speaking to the internet. Uh, and presumably, if you've got somebody who is, you know, malicious enough and with the skills to do it, not only can they start turning off and on your lights, which is annoying, um, but they could pres presumably turn off your heating in the middle of winter, or they could, uh, you know, there are, there are things that can be done at a grand scale to an entire population of a, of a country. I'm thinking, I mean, years ago, there was a, a, an attack on Estonia um, where they, they sh essentially shut down the country and potentially caused a starvation event. Um, so what do we as individuals, I guess is my question, what should we be thinking about? How concerned should we be about this? I think, first of all, we should definitely be concerned about this. We should definitely, I think the better term is be aware of the risks. Mm -hmm. So these risks are out there. Usually, uh, if we apply just, you know, very basic security uh, procedures, regulations, and stuff like that, really not complicated stuff, we kind of, you know, we can be uh, safe, let's say, in a 99% uh, uh, ratio. Um, and uh, I, I think that's the, most that's the most important thing, just the awareness to these things. Because uh, as I was saying, like at the same sentence, I can say, look, this is not a, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go into a bunker and, you know, close everything, disconnect from the internet. Uh, this also doesn't make sense uh, to do. So I would say, yeah, just keep using whatever you're using. Technology is going forward, go forward with it. Just be aware that everything that you connect today to the internet, everything that becomes digital, everything that becomes connected might also be a risk. Um, at Checkpoint Research, we did uh, several uh, uh, research uh, projects uh, just on these type of, of, of things. There's a very unique category uh, that we like you know, to find projects on. We call it the um, things you wouldn't imagine uh, that could be hacked. Uh, so, for example, we showed how we can take over your network, 
by sending a fax over mm. to, to your network, just by sending a fax. Uh, we also showed how we can control your entire network just by um, uh, exploiting your smart smart light bulbs at home. So th these are the kind of things that you're talking about. So sure. we show it is possible. Others show the same as well. Uh, well, I have to say the one that alarmed me was I watched a presentation that you did where you showed how a network could be attacked via somebody's camera. Uh, there was a digital SLR camera that happened to be on the network and you were able to go in through that. That's that's quite astonishing because it's not, I mean, I have exactly that camera that you were showing. <laughs> and I was thinking, right, I had not thought of that as a as a risky entry point. So, so yeah, that, that's a th the thing is that everything, as you said, is connected. Uh, mm -hmm. Things that you wouldn't imagine that why should they even be connected? And they are connected, and sometimes you're not even aware that they are, con they are connected. Mm. So uh, again, this goes back to the question of awareness. You should be aware of these things, and if you don't need them, disconnect them. And if you need them connected, make sure you are protected, at least you know the bare minimum that you can do. And what is the bare minimum? The bare minimum usually is to make sure that every connected device is updated with the latest and uh, you know firmware versions security versions usually unfortunately is something that you know most people don't do they don't even know how to do and usually it's not a big problem there's a big button saying update just push that button once in a while um that, that's one thing another thing is you know check i mean if your camera is connected to the internet at your house that might be fine but if, it, if it's exposed out there to the internet, then you have a serious issue. It shouldn't be. Um, and that's something that you can check. And if you don't have the technical skills to check that, just find the nearest uh, somebody who knows a bit about computers and he can definitely set this up for you. It's not a big issue. I want to run some terms by you because I've heard them and they sound important and I don't know what they mean. Let's uh, start with zero day. What's that? That, that has a, also a very interesting uh, background to it. So uh, let's start from, from the past, right? So uh, when I started um, my, I don't know, career or my, 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 my online life, mm -hmm. there was still no internet. Uh, we had BBSs, this bulletin board systems. I remember. Yeah, and it was a great time. Uh, and what did we use this wonderful technology for? For obviously sharing uh, games usually illegal games. Uh, that was like the cracked games, hacked games, stuff like that. That was what we did as kids. And, and at these times, yeah, the games, the freshest games, the newest games, the ones that just been out, you know, from the from the vendor, the BBS has called them zero days. Hmm. That's where the terminology came from, zero day. But, you know, as we grew and as cybersecurity uh, came to be, zero day changed a bit. And now it doesn't refer to uh, video games or computer games, and now it refers to vulnerabilities, um, security issues, basically, that can, you know, cause damage to whoever is, is using them. And those vulnerabilities are referred to as zero days when they have not been discovered yet. I mean, nobody found them, maybe someone found them and he is maybe exploiting them, but the vendor or the community didn't find out about them yet. And that's why they are called zero days. The minute they are detected and the minute they are protected, they are no longer zero days. Now they become one days, two days, three days, end days, um, and so on. So that's a zero day. Right. Um, what's Stuxnet? <laughs> um, Stuxnet is the name of a um, very famous... Um, malware or um, an attack uh, that uh, happened uh, uh, in 2011, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is the attack that uh, caused the Iranian nuclear uh, facilities to stop operating for several years. Uh, so those facilities are usually top secret and uh, very, very well guarded. Uh, and somehow someone managed to put this, uh, you know, piece of malicious code inside uh, the machines that are responsible for the centrifuge um, and made the machines go boom, basically. Wow. Um, and this kind of, you know, paused the, paused the Iranian um, nuclear 
uh, program for several years. Um, it's attributed to you know many uh, several places. I don't think we should go into that, but it was I think one of the uh, first cases when we saw the the, the, the great power uh, of cybersecurity, of offensive cybersecurity, uh, and, and the damage and what it can really do. This happened again in 2011, so ages ago in you know, internet terms. Sure. But it's it's interesting that, I mean, it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that you would want to have connected to the internet. So basically, uh, it wasn't connected to the internet. As as many, you know, military facilities and top secret facilities uh, all around the world, usually they are not connected to the internet exactly uh, to prevent uh, these and other kinds of attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, still, you know, it's still really unknown what really happened there. Uh, but the common word on the street is that uh, uh, what happened is that somebody or somehow they managed to uh, put some USB sticks uh, maybe in the car parking lot or maybe they just handed them over to, you know, uh, workers from the facility. Uh, They looked, you know, legit because a lot of people are just giving you USB sticks. Um, And then it just takes one of these guys to take this USB stick and put it into his computer inside the top secret network uh, in the in the in the facility sure and that's how the malicious code was able to get into the facility without them being connected to the internet right you you mentioned the phrase offensive cybersecurity and that's kind of that's an interesting uh, concept because it's not a because you think of cybersecurity as being preventing things from happening to you, but obviously it's something that can be deployed to attack. Uh, is this something that you're trained for when you become a cybersecurity specialist? First of all, I say that it's a zero-sum game. If you protect against something, then somebody needs to attack. Uh, so it's always offensive against defensive. Um, and is this something that you are trained for? Um, from my perspective, uh, uh, if you want to be a good defender, you need to n- at least know how uh, offenders work, mm-hmm. uh, how they think like. I don't think that everybody gets this training, everybody who works at the uh, defensive cybersecurity, um, for many reasons. Um, some are legit, some are uh, less legit, I think, but um, it's not a common thing for everyone to know offensive security or the techniques or the methodologies used there. Uh, but I think as years go along, more and more people uh, know about this. There are more courses about this. It, the, the material gets integrated into many cybersecurity uh, trainings uh, and offerings out there. So um, I think the knowledge is being shared slowly but surely out there. Interesting. Um, is this kind of is this the future or even the present of warfare, or is this kind of more happening at the skirmish level? More, uh, you know just small attacks on on individual installations or, or whatever. I mean, is there a global battle going on that we may not necessarily be aware of? Ah, of course. I, I think that we are aware of, it, <laughs> at least me. And if, and if you look at, you know, things that are going uh, in the world, uh, many cases, then yes, definitely cybersecurity is the new uh, arena inside any uh, modern uh, warfare. And it's only getting bigger and it's only getting... Uh, better uh, i would say and definitely next wars hopefully we won't see them but uh, if they will be if there will be such we will definitely see a lot of uh, offensive cyber security uh, uh, taking place uh, throughout this war uh, and maybe even you know winning the war and i think even the interesting part is that for offensive cyber security even the term war uh, gets you know, it's it's not the war that we know. Uh, it's not tank against tank. It's not man with a rifle against man with a rifle. Now it's just someone sitting in, you know, one part of the world pushing a button against somebody sitting in another part of the world pushing a button with real life consequences, with real things going on. Uh, but there is no actual war. You're not sending anyone to the front lines. So it's a different concept, something that we need to, you know, probably get used to. Well, this is something that has been part of the the public imagination since I don't know Matthew Broderick and War Games. I mean, this is a long time ago. Were you were you the kind of kid that was sitting there watching this and going, "I have to do something about this. This is my life now." Definitely, that that was one one of the cases. And, and yes, you know, I I love science fiction. I love uh, I love this this kind of stuff. Definitely, it had it had a big impact on on me as a kid and and kind of 
carved my way into cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're if you're asking how did I specifically go into cybersecurity? That's exactly what I'm asking. So I'll give you a good answer for that. There's one very interesting or uh, rememberable case that I remember. So I, I was, I think, 14 years old, maybe 13 years old. And, uh, you know, as, as I told you, computers didn't have internet yet. We had, and we loved video games. Um, and we shared them either through BBSs or people would come to my home with floppy drives and we shove them into the computer and, and do whatever we do in order to play the games. Um, and I remember this day when somebody came to me with these floppy drives and I installed the game and I started playing it and then my computer got, you know, crashed all, all, all of a sudden. And looking at what's going on, I see that there is a computer virus that, you know, took over my computer. I still remember the name of this virus. His name was Haifa. Mm. But by the way, this is an Israeli city. So uh, it, it didn't make me feel very, you know, proud uh, of being Israeli. I just felt like, oh, my God, this is the end. Uh, all of my video games, all of my life, I'm sitting like 18 hours a day playing this game, playing this computer. Mm. Um, and what's going on? I... I remember this distinct feeling of you know ah, that, that that was such a bad feeling and i think that was at least for me the moment where i decided that i'm gonna fight these things i'm gonna learn how they work i'm gonna understand how they do this i'm gonna prevent i'm not gonna go through this situation uh, ever again and uh, if you'll ask me, I think that was the tipping point for me. And from that day, I decided that I, I will do cybersecurity. Again, there was no such term then, but uh, I will do computer security when I grow up. And I love that this is this is like a comic book one superhero origin story that, uh, you, you know, you got the spark, you got the, uh, the passion and the drive. It made you so angry. You put on the cape and the mask and now you're protecting the world from uh, from these villains. To what end? I mean, what? Is this a never-ending battle? Can we ever win? No, um, I don't think there's the end for this battle. As, no, as long as there will be new technologies, there will be uh, new issues, there will be new bugs, there will be new vulnerabilities. It's not. It's actually the, the opposite of ending. It's just being, you know, keep, keeps getting bigger and bigger, worse and worse. Uh, so I think that I have a job security for, uh, you know, a long time uh, from now. And... Um, that's basically it. That seems like a nice place to be. Um, okay, so I'm interested not just in what the individuals can do and not just what the you know national governments can do, but at a sort of a mid scale, what can a, a, like a business do? What are those? Like you say, you've uh, you've got a company, you employ a few people, uh, everybody has laptops they take home. Um, you know, what sorts of things should you be thinking about from uh, from that sort of perspective? Yeah, so organizations are a much, you know, they, they are a different story. It's it's a it's a much bigger playground. I mean, there's a lot more technology that's integrated into it. The risks are definitely uh, different than if you're an individual. Uh, there's a lot more uh, at stake here. Um, and usually, you know, you have those systems that you have, the technology that you have are much more complex. They are interconnected. Even you don't even know, you know, exactly what's there and how does it work. There's no one single individual who knows everything. Um, and that calls for um, different types of solutions, different types of protections uh, for organizations. And really, you know, if you look at the cybersecurity uh, field, there's, I wouldn't say dozens, there are hundreds or thousands uh, of uh, such solutions, one for every scenario if your organization is working uh, cloud based if it's you know not cloud based if you have if you are running this business if you are running this software if you have users connecting remotely if you don't have users connecting remotely and and for each one of these scenarios there's usually a solution or several solutions um and you know it's a it's an industry what what can i say mm. So are there any best practices uh, that we should apply across the board? Like if you've got a company, everybody should have this on their phone or they should use that on their laptop or, um, you know, these are the rules that you should follow? So I, it's really hard to say because uh, even there the world is changing, you know. Uh, so uh, we, organizations used to be one, you know, uh, v very similar to each other, say 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you have a data center, you have your workers, you have, you know, maybe 
one office, maybe several offices, but today the situation uh, changes, changes a lot because every organi organization looks completely different in terms of um, his, you know, how, how his IT networks are built. Um, and and th that's the reason why there is no one common solution that could be applied to everyone. I think there are several uh, solutions and usually the right approach uh, will be to use the layered solution. Uh, so build layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of security. So start by, for example, uh, firewall, you know, don't let in what you, sh what you don't need to let in. Just like the advice I gave uh, to the home users, you know, uh, if you don't need this port open, just have it closed. Uh, so a firewall will take care of that for you. Then if you need people to, or, or people to connect remotely, or if you have offices remotely, then a VPN, uh, use a VPN solution that can solve this. Um, then, you know, you are receiving emails, let's say, uh, every day, then these emails might deliver malicious stuff. You need some email protection uh, for you. And then, um, it just keeps going on. And this is even, you know, the traditional organization now organizations are shifting to the cloud it sounds really big but you know uh, this is the world uh, uh, and cloud uh, now offers another challenge for security vendors so it's a different world and the systems are not sitting on premise now they're sitting somewhere in the world and sometimes they're not even systems they are services how do we protect them them so again there's a lot of methodologies there and a lot of companies and a lot of solutions um, and it's really quite a complex world. What can I say? Mm. Yeah, I mean, where, where do you start? I mean, I know that the the good advice is, you know, use two-factor authorization and change your passwords from time to time, uh, those sorts of things. Is, is there anything else that uh, might be counterintuitive that you think, oh, actually, one good tip, you should do this? So this is a really good tip, what you said, for individuals, uh, not for, for organizations. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, yeah, okay, if you have... Uh, if you're an individual, use two-factor authentication. Really, really good advice that will help you uh, a lot with, with a lot of things. But if you're an organization, it doesn't really make sense. Well, I have 5,000 employees. What do you mean use two-factor authentication for all of them and for what? They are using thousands of services. So, yeah, again, organizations make it much more complicated. But for individuals, the advice that you gave is perfect. Right. Well, I know you have good job security and you have this really great superhero origin story, but you'd be a pretty good criminal, I imagine. Uh, what's stopping you from going down that path? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, my conscience, maybe? Yeah. Uh, my, my, yeah I, Is that what well, we're relying on for everybody who does what you do, not to become sort of these, uh, you know, Lex Luthor masterminds that go and, you know, uh, hold cities to ransom or rob banks or whatever it might be? It's just they're good people? Uh, well, yes, basically. I mean, uh, why do you trust uh, cops? I mean, they could uh, go and uh, do bad stuff as well, right? Like they choose to be the good guys. Uh, and and I hope that most people choose to be the good guys. Uh, um, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, well, well, we know that there are some, um, you know, bad people in the world. Are there any sort of, like there's some major headlines recently um, I know, uh, like solar winds is a phrase that I've heard, um, and there's been some other stuff in the news. Do you want to tell us what sort of the big, uh, the big headlines are, and and maybe even sort of help us understand who the baddies might be? So uh, yeah, you mentioned one of the really biggest events that uh, took place uh, just a few months ago. It's called solar winds, uh, and actually it's called sunburst. Uh, the attack solar winds is the is actually the the product that was involved in this attack. Um, and I think this was really like maybe a milestone in development of offensive uh, cybersecurity, uh, something that I, I didn't see throughout my entire career such such an attack. Um, that was a pretty interesting case. Um, it was uh, something that we refer to as a supply chain attack. Um, and that's where, um, so imagine if I want to attack some target, but this target is really, you know, tough. Uh, I can't really attack it. It's really well protected and it will cost me a lot of money and a lot, and I will spend a lot of time in order to attack it. Uh, but I basically, I can do something else. I can find out who is, you know, supplying things to this, uh, to this target. Uh, so, for example, okay, I know that he's using this product, this 
product is called SolarWinds. It's being developed by this company uh, that's based in Austin, Texas, and it's uh, doing that. But you know, this company is much less secure than my original target. So why won't I go and attack this company, SolarWinds? Uh, and after I attack it, successfully attack it, let's plan something, let's implant something inside their software, the same software that they then deliver to my original target. Um, and this is referred to again as a supply chain attack, and that's that's basically what happened. Um, so this uh, company, SolarWinds, uh, got uh, hacked, and whoever their customers were received um, malicious updates of the software. The problem with this, that as a customer of SolarWinds, there's practically no way for you to understand that this software update that you just got, like, like you do every week or every month, is malicious because it looks legitimate. It's signed by SolarWinds. It's, you know, it matches every criteria that you can imagine. And still, it's malicious. Um, and that's what happened. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, SolarWinds is a very successful company. Not, not unfortunately, unfortunate for them, but they have um, a lot of customers. Uh, and a lot of major customers, uh, most of them are Fortune 500 companies, and you know you can imagine. Um, and all of them are now targets of some unknown attacker, mm. uh, and he can now go into their networks, although their networks are super, super protected. Um, and that attack, you know, was on such a large scale. So many organizations got hit by this. And I'm not just talking about, you know, any organizations. I'm talking about the biggest names uh, that there are, uh, like, you know, Microsoft or Cisco or IBM or um, so. And, and the list goes on. Uh, so these are really, you know, the software vendors and the hardware vendors, which we, you know, rely on and use on a daily basis. Mm. And just just the thought of what happens if they are now hacked and, you know, you know, this guy or this organization or this group uh, can now, you know, access their source code, do whatever they want with their products. This is you, you, you mentioned the nightmare uh, scenario uh, earlier. I think this get close to this nightmare scenario. I mean, the potential of damage that someone could do uh, using this attack um, is mind blowing, um, and and eventually we don't really know what were the consequences, what were the real consequences of this attack. We just found bits and pieces of the attack, um, and yeah, this is this is scary. This is scary to think about it. Uh, and again, you need to go and think: what is the motivation? Why would someone do something like that? I don't have a clear answer for that, uh, but uh, I think it's something that we should all be aware of that something like this happened. And I think we're going to hear about this incident for the months and years to come. Surely we're going to find more details. Um, and it's one of the major events that I ever seen in my career. Mm. Oh. And something about exchange servers. There's been uh, something just recently. Uh, that's that's a lot of people's email. Yeah, like you know, like SolarWinds wasn't enough, and just a few months uh, after that um, came another issue. That's it's a really big issue. Now we're talking about just a few weeks ago, uh, where um, a security researcher uh, from Taiwan, his name is Orange Tsai, that's his nickname at least. Uh, he found a vulnerability in Microsoft Exchange servers. So basically, these are the servers uh, which manage email, uh, uh, sending and receiving uh, for 99.9% .9 of the organizations out there. Um, and the specific vulnerability that he found can may allow an attacker um, to take full control over the servers and basically over the network uh that he attacks without any authentication needed without anything but just access to this server and usually you know these servers should be somehow exposed to the internet because that's what they do uh, and that means that basically 99.9 percent uh, of the organizations in the world were actually vulnerable to this thing um and the worst thing about it is not that you know sometimes you find a vulnerability you tell the vendor about it, he fixes it, and 
catastrophe is avoided, everything is okay. In this case, this vulnerability, once he found it, it, it turned out that it was already being used in the wild. So somebody might have found it before him, but this someone just didn't tell Microsoft about it. He just took it and used it. Mm. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, how many days, weeks, months, years have we lived thinking that everything is okay while the, there is this someone uh, in the world that can just, you know, with a click of a button, go into a, almost any organization in the world that, that he wants to and do whatever he wants in there, being completely undetected. Again, that's, uh, you know, to finish off with a scary story. So here is, here is the scary story for you. So when they find a vulnerability, presumably the response is to patch the vulnerability, but there isn't a way to find out what that vulnerability has allowed, right? Well, you know what? You, you always know what the potential is, right? But, you know, the good guys would report the vulnerabilities to the vendors. Sure. The bad guys would find the vulnerabilities and not report them at all. And what usage do they do with these vulnerabilities is unknown. Presumably there's a market for that. There's a market for vulnerabilities. People are saying, you know, you find something in, uh, you know, a Microsoft Exchange server, um, you, you come to us and we'll give you some money for it. So first of all, there are several markets for these uh, for these kind of things. There are there is the let's say the legitimate quote unquote markets, mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, out. This is by you know uh, legitimate companies, sometimes uh, even uh, nations and states. Uh, they, they you know they they want to uh, have access to such uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, sometimes, by the way, companies which have uh, these programs called bug bounties. Saying, okay, you find a vulnerability in my product. You did a lot of work for that. Let me pay you uh, your bounty for that. Uh, and there's actually a lot of money going on in this uh, in these markets. But these are the legitimate markets. Right. Same markets also exist in the you know darker corners of the internet, where you sell to you know much less legitimate uh, people your, the vulnerabilities that you find. And you might imagine how they use these vulnerabilities later. The prices in these dark places usually are much, much, much higher than the legitimate ones. Wow. So where to from here? I mean, uh, do we need to be more... You mentioned awareness at the beginning rather than, than concern. What's our sort of recommended further reading here? What should we go and find out to, to be more aware of these sorts of things? Well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, there's there's a lot being written and said, and 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 you know, a lot of places you can go and hear about cybersecurity if you want to, and read about it. Uh, it's really all over the place. I can't recommend one, you know, place uh, as opposed to another, but really the internet is full of them. Just go into Google and type, you know, cybersecurity. You will find uh, a lot of good uh, uh, reading places. I think for the general public, you know, just be aware of the situation, be aware of the new findings, be aware of the new uh, vulnerabilities being found, of the new uh, cybercrime campaigns out there, of the new techniques being used. So you should be aware of that. I'm not saying you, you shouldn't, you, you don't need to understand every bit and byte of that. You don't really need to understand how it works or, you know, who is doing that. You just need to understand that it's out there and it's being used. And as long as you have that in mind, I think you are already uh, halfway to being protected. Um, and, and, and the second half is much easier than, than, than the first one. And it's just you know, a matter of pushing some buttons and probably you'll be protected from that. But if you don't know uh, what's out there and if you don't know what's the risk, uh, uh, then there is very small chance that you'll be able to protect yourself against it. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's uh, reassuring to know that there are good people like you plugging the holes and, and making the world safer for us. So, Yaniv, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Sure, it was my pleasure. That's Yaniv Balmas, who is head of cyber research at Checkpoint and also self-confessed former BBS computer game pirate. You can find some of Yaniv's presentations about cybersecurity on YouTube, as I did, and you can also follow him on Twitter, at YNVB. I'm Dubber, at Dubber on Twitter, and MTF Labs is at MTF Labs everywhere. Thanks to Airtone and Be Still the Earth for the music. 
to Run Dreamer for the MTF audio logo that you're going to hear shortly, and to the MTF team, Sergio, Mars, and Jem, for making it all come together. That's it from me this week. Don't forget to back up your hard drives, wear a mask, update your software, wash your hands, change your passwords, stay safe, and we'll talk soon. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.